the C128 and the Mega 65 can automatically load programs from disk when being powered on or when the boot command is typed in. In this video, I will walk you through the process of setting up auto boot on the 128 and the Mega 65. And as the title of this video says, we can make a single disk auto boot on both systems. Plus, I'll show you how to seamlessly switch into C64 mode, allowing you to auto boot your favorite C64 games on both computers. Welcome to the 8-Bit Theory! To see how Autoboot works, let's just create a simple program. This should just show a message, so we know that something is happening. On the Mega 65, it is really easy to auto-run this program. We just need to call it Autoboot C65. And when the system boots, it checks the disk or the disk image for this file name and runs it if found. The same is true for the Commander X16, by the way. The only difference is the file name. You guessed it. Just name the file Autoboot X16 and there we go. On the C128, it's a bit more sophisticated to get programs to Autoboot. Instead of checking for existence of a specific file, it reads a special sector from the disk to find out whether the disk is made for Autoboot. You would need some expert knowledge and the right tool, like a disk editor, to get that done right. But before we look into that, let me create the same simple program again, just as a basic 7 program. A simple program just doing print would definitely work on both systems, but I would like to evolve this a bit later on. So let's use a dedicated one and let's call this one Autoboot C128. Now, how do we modify the disk to load this? We will use a tool called MacBootMake. And this program hosts a load of options. Let's start with the program info to give some credit. This was created by a well-known member in the C64 community, MacBacon. He also created and or maintains many other tools like the Acme Cross Compiler or VDC Basic, which I covered in previous videos. And I will definitely get back to for more. Of course, I'll add a link to the repo on GitHub to the description. Now back to the program. The great part is it has a preview option. By pressing D, we can see what our auto boot configuration would look like. And E allows us to enter our own message. Let's do that. And this is how it looks like. It keeps the word booting and appends our message, including three dots. What else do we have? We can specify the drive we want to write auto boot data to. Then we have the options to store a new boot block or remove an existing one. And down below, we finally have all the interesting options. You can define if you want the local character set enabled. I will link to a page that shows all the keyboard layouts in the description. Next comes the option to remove the word booting. And this is how it looks like if we do. We can also disable switching between upper and lower case. Next, we decide whether we want to run a basic program or a machine language program. This is important because it makes a difference in how to run a program. And then very important, the file name. We will enter our simple program here, Autoboot C128. Keys 7 and 8 act as plus minus selectors that allows you to browse through device numbers 4 to 30. And the same goes for the memory bank. We will also leave that at 15. Okay, with that being said, let's write our configuration to disk. We press S for store and the program logs some interesting information for us. And we're done. We can quit the program by pressing Q and we can either type boot or just reset the computer to try this. Boot works. Now let's reset the machine. And that also works as expected. When experimenting with this and added more files or modified existing ones after the boot sector was created, I recognized that sometimes the Mega 65 would report a corrupted BAM. When this happened, also auto boot on the C128 crashed into the monitor. I wasn't exactly able to reproduce what caused the corruption, but I think it's related to manipulating disk images outside of emulators or real machines. If I sticked to copying programs like Drag Copy or Maverick, the problem didn't come up. If you find out what the problem is or you just know, 
please let me know in the comments. Okay, now let's look into booting C64 games. Did you know that you can also use the go64 command inside a basic program in basic 7 and basic 65? Let's do that. And let's run it. The bad thing is, everything that comes after that command is lost. It's not kept once C64 mode is active. Of course, it wasn't going to be as easy as that, right? Fortunately, some smart people have thought about ways to overcome this. On the Mega 65, there is a tool called Etherload that allows to load programs via Ethernet and then switch to Go64 mode if it's a C64 program. Mega 65 community member Kibo took that idea and packed it into a standalone solution that can also be used to auto boot into Go64 mode. On the C128, a similar approach is required. Compute Magazine of October 1986, the year when I started primary school, by the way, had a small type-in program that also allowed to seamlessly switch to the C64 mode. It is called 128 Boot 64. Both approaches follow a similar approach from a high-level perspective, but in detail they differ a lot. We just examined the auto boot concept. What needs to happen next is that we need to take steps that allow Go64 mode to work on data that has been set in C128 mode. So we need to write the data, switch to C64 mode and have the C64 automatically pick up where the C128 or Mega 65 left off. Let's stick to the C128 first. Handing over information from the 128 to C64 mode is done by tricking the 64 mode into thinking that a cartridge is plugged in. When a cartridge is plugged in, certain registers are set and cartridge memory is mapped at hex 8000 into C64 memory. The program 128 boot 64 does all that. It's a basic program that only pokes a machine language program into memory. I distill the readable assembly language version out of that. First, it writes all the data into RAM at 8000 hex, that makes the C64 think that a module is plugged in. Then it recreates the reset sequence of the C64. While the C64 is testing all the memory, it does not clear or change it. After the reset sequence is done, the code that is supposedly coming from the cartridge is putting the load command onto the screen and the return key is put into the keyboard buffer twice. One time for the load command and another time for the run command. This program expects one specific file name to exist on the disk and it will load that. But we can modify this program to use a variable file name, not just a fixed one. And we can even add a menu that allows for selecting a specific file. The machine language program is generated on the fly so we can make sure the right file name is handed over. Also, we will make sure that the right drive number is provided. The original code is fixed to drive number 8. I will load the game straight up as a showcase that's about 18 kilobytes in size. And the unaccelerated loading time from keypress in the menu to execution takes about 42 seconds. With Chifitos we would be down to about 11 seconds. Summarizing, this approach just makes sure the C64 is executing the right command, but it does not take advantage of the C128's burst mode, for example. Let's look into C64 run on the Mega 65. You can find this program on the file host, link in the description. It consists of a couple of lines in BASIC and a machine language program, and this approach does take advantage of the Mega 65 superior loading speed. The machine language that was generated on the fly on the C128 is now a dedicated binary. The basic program reserves some memory for loading the program we want to run, then it loads the machine language helper to hex 42000. Loading the program is done by using bload with the R parameter. R means raw mode. That puts the program into the memory location we defined here, 
the first two bytes of the binary that would usually specify the target address are just interpreted as regular data bytes this way. And after that, it loads the program we want to finally run into the memory error we prepared with the mem command before. The part about the drive number is also worth mentioning. On all Commodore machines, peak 186 gave the address of the last used drive. On the Mega 65, the getLFS kernel function was introduced in ROM version 92398. Checking the ROM version can be done by calling free uh, with parameter minus one. So before this ROM version, we can safely assume that the location is still 186. But after that, we can use the kernel function, which puts the right value into the X register. The rreg command puts that into a variable for us. So in case we boot from a device different than eight, this should still work. Finally, the basic program executes the machine language helper and this works its magic to make sure the program we want to run is in the right memory position and it maps the C64 ROMs and ports accordingly. As you can see, in Go64 mode, we only see the run command, so the initial loading of the program was done before switching to C64 mode and it is mega 65 fast. Let me show the boot process again without pausing this time. Just as on the C128, I added a simple menu with the same programs to choose from. That menu can still be improved, like loading the list of games from a sequential file which both autoboot programs could read from, for example. But I will leave this to you. Please feel free to extend and enrich this as you see fit. And if you do, please let me know in the comments. I would also like to link to that in the description. I initially thought I would be done with this video at this point. While we couldn't take advantage of burst mode on the C128, I also didn't find any implementations I could reuse. But then can't we just B-load the binary just as we did on the Mega 65? I did an implementation with B-load. That worked. The downside, the programs loaded can only be 25 kilobytes large. Because B-load can write to the end of our basic menu as the lowest address, that's somewhere after 1C01 or 7169 decimal. At hex 8000 we need to have our cartridge code, otherwise the C64 mode wouldn't know what we want it to do. The cartridge code is different now. It has to copy the program to 800 hex and only has to fill the screen with the run command. The load command is not required anymore. Straight up with its 18 kilobytes loads just fine and with burst mode it only took 9 seconds now versus 42 seconds before. To see if games above 25 kilobyte size really don't work, I will load the game Kaufmann's Gilde, that's German for Immersion Skilled. It has a whopping 51 kilobytes. As you can see, it doesn't. And that might be a constraint for too many games. How could we have more memory available? If we could load the binary into bank 1, we would be able to use 30k. Because bank 1 is empty, mostly, but C64 mode can't use bank 1, right? Right. But also, bank selection is not an active part of the C64's reset routine. So, if we switch to bank 1 before resetting into C64 mode, C64 mode will also use bank 1. Of course, without being aware of this fact. So, we need to do two things. First, we will need a modified Go64 routine that switches to Bank 1 before going into C64 mode. And again, I found something on the internet, and again, written by McBacon. You see, that part is only 16 bytes long. If you're interested in the details, feel free to check the chapter on Memory Management Unit in the book Mapping the Commodore 128 or in the C128's Programmer's Reference Guide. While this was working and we now could load files with 30 kilobytes size, that cartridge code at hex 8000 still was a real blocker. When I reached out to Mark with one or two questions about his code, he also mentioned that it's possible to do this without the constraints to program size. 
He did it for the loader of the Digital Talk Disc magazine, which German viewers might be familiar with. Make sure to check it out, I will add a link in the description. Instead of doing a hard reset, it's possible to just execute the relevant steps of the reset routine manually. This way C64 ROMs are loaded and so on, but the system doesn't go through a hard reset. And that means that the program in charge on the C128 side will just stay in charge on the C64 side. So no cartridge code at hex 8000 is required at all. On the left we see the code from our previous approach. It loads the program, then the cartridge code, then the custom Go64 code that switches to bank 1 and then calls the reset routine. This is called at the end. And on the right we have the code that's supposed to keep control and works without the regular reset. First we load the custom Go64 code, then we load the program code. Oh, and then I just set everything to black, so maybe the C64 mode initialization isn't so heavy on the screen. At the end we call the custom Go64 routine that does the soft switch without losing control. That Go64 routine becomes larger now. For one, the seamless switch to Go64 mode requires more commands. For another, it now also contains the code for the C64 side, which was in the hex 8000 code before. Ok, let's check Kaufmann's Gilde again to see if this really works. By the way, if you have trouble with memory in C64 mode on your 128, try loading some programs this way. And we have a running program. As this is using bank 1, it might be a good way to identify memory problems. All of this is tailored around programs starting at the regular basic start address, so it might not work for every program out there. If you have one of these, you might just want to use the 128 boot 64 way I introduced first. Auto boot can not only be used for games, of course, I use it for programming with Tune Simon's Basic, for example. Tune Simon's Basic is most convenient to load from a cartridge, usually and emulators can easily use CRT or BIN files. On a real Mega 65 and in Go64 mode, it is not yet possible to do that, and it might never be. But this way I can just auto-load the Tune Simon's basic environment from disk equally fast. If you want to learn more about the mysteries of autoboot on the C128, be sure to check out the video by Retrobits on GEOS 128REU autoboot. The C128 had a bit more screen time than the Mega 65 this time, but that's mainly due to the fact that I had to work on the solution to that for myself quite a bit. A huge thank you goes to Kibo, his B-load approach on the Mega 65 side got me inspired to keep trying beyond the 128 boot 64 approach. And also special thanks to McBacon, who basically already built what I was trying to figure out. Without you guys, the audience would just have been staring at a blank screen for the last 18 minutes or so, because this video would have been impossible. If you like this video, please subscribe to the channel and enable notifications to not miss the next updates. That's it for this time, I hope it's an inspiration for you to try some of these things with your games and programs. You will find the links to all the tools in the description. If you find use for them in your programs, please drop me a note. Thanks for watching the 8-bit theory, obsolete but not useless.